Welcome to the 18th reading of my memoir, The Innocence of Guilt. Mildon Hall, The Huts, Lower Camp. Nissen huts, originally designed for military use, not for families, were constructed of a semicircular corrugated iron roof which reached down to the ground on both sides, erected on a concrete base. After the war, the council renovated them, added flush lavatories, cut windows into the sides, and divided the interiors to create bedrooms. The lack of insulation made them hot in summer and cold in winter. We were allocated hut 5A in centre block. There were no curtains at the windows and that first morning as David and I shivered around the black cast iron stove, feet absorbing the dampness from the exposed concrete floor as we dressed for school. Curious little faces peeped through at us. Mum went to the window to shoo them away but they only ran off for a while, returning to mock us in our partially clothed state. I'll set the dog on you if you don't go away, she yelled. It was too much for me, and I began to cry. Our dog, Jill, wouldn't hurt them, but they didn't know that, so they took off. I walked with David to the corner of the road for the school bus to pick us up and take us into town. The battered old biscuit tin, so named by the camp children, rattled us all the way there. It sounded as if at any moment it would fall apart and spill all its little biscuits out onto the road, but we arrived safe and sound. At school, I soon realised that in the eyes of those who knew us, we had come down in the world. No longer decent town children, let alone the children of a respected businessman. We were now poor children from the huts. When moisture trickled down the inside walls and our clothes and bedding became damp, we realised the sorry state of the hut, despite being told that we lived at the lower, more salubrious end of camp. Mum removed the bedding every morning and tried to dry it out all day long by the inefficient stove. Constantly cold and miserable, when at home, I took to visiting dry huts, playing there, as long as other mothers would tolerate me. The families I met were pleasant enough. My mother held outdoor meetings to encourage them to fight for better health care, as so many of their babies were sickly. Periodically, children ventured down from the upper end, challenging the lower end children to stone fights. Some used slingshots and rarely missed their targets. Boys were mostly involved, but older girls occasionally joined in, and the fights often ended with blood spilt on both sides. None of the parents ever tried to stop them. A narrow path through some bushes led to the upper huts. Somebody warned my mother not to let any of our family set foot on that path because the people who lived up there would attack you as soon as look at you. My 10th birthday came and went without any celebration I can recall. Celebration seemed out of place in our miserable circumstances. Dad took to riding around on his bicycle, looking for work, and Christmas, the happiest time of the year, beckoned. With food at home scarce, school dinners at the canteen were a necessity. Hot, appetising cheese potato pie, my favourite, with its crispy cheese topping. Pink, green or yellow semolina pudding, probably made with much watered-down milk because I tolerated it. At that uncertain time in our family, Mum performed one of her special touches, brightening up a little corner of my life. For a while, each Sunday morning, 
I discovered a small chocolate bar at the bottom of my bed. I presume that David received one as well. And this became the highlight of my week. Waking up, crawling down to the bottom of the bed, grabbing the chocolate bar. A comfort in the middle of so much discomfort. For Christmas, my mother said I could pick one thing. The pillowcase stuffed full of toys could not be for the holiday of 1952. It would have to wait for a better time, even though the song of the season was I Saw Mummy Kissing Santa Claus. I asked for a Bible, one with illustrations of the stories, although I'm not sure why. I wasn't attending Sunday school anymore. Maybe it was the effect of all those scripture verses I wrote out as punishment at school. I can't promise to get you one, dear, but I'll do my best, she said, and her best effort brought a good result. A small children's Bible, the King James Version, not easy to read. I didn't mind. The illustrations came in full colour, so I was more than content. Poor Mum wasn't, though and for good reason. The conditions in the hut verged on intolerable, and she said if we didn't get out of there soon, we would all become sick. All winter long we shivered and shook. Mum's constant battle against the dampness exhausted her, so she searched for another hut. The only vacant one stood in the upper hut section, is it dry? she asked the woman, who gave her the information. Dry as a bone, the woman replied, but it's smaller than the one you're in now, and I wouldn't move up there. It's rough. It's not for the likes of you and your family. Mum wasted no time in checking it out. While David and I were at school, she bravely walked up the forbidden path and found hut number 14, standing up on a slight rise at the very end of camp at the edge of the forest. No one attacked her, so she asked the council member for the key. Cutting ourselves off from the lower end families who had been good to us, but not having much choice, we prepared to move once again. We'd lasted three months in that cold, damp hut, and Mum said, we'd take our chances with the so-called undesirables at the upper end. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to subscribe, like or comment on this reading and hopefully you will tune in to the next one. Bye for now.